Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Innal hamdalillah nahmaduhu ta'ala wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa natubu ilayh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina man yahdihillahu fala mudilla la wa man yudlil fala hadiya la wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu wa salamuhu alayhi amma ba'd fa inna asdaq al hadith kalamullahi azza wa jal wa khayr al hadi hadi muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharr al umuri muhdathatuha wa kullu muhdathatin bid'ah wa kullu bid'atin dalalatin wa kullu dalalah fin nari wa ba'd our praise is due to allah we praise and we beseech and we seek his forgiveness we seek refuge with allah from the evilness of our own souls and the evilness of our actions whomever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided them there's nothing or no one to mislead them and whomever he has led astray there is no guide for them I publicly bear witness that there is no deity worthy they worship except Allah. He is one and doesn't have any partners. As I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his slave and his final messenger. As for what follows, for indeed the most truthful of all speech is the speech of Allah. And the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the most evilest of affairs are novelties in the religion. For, every, for all novelties into the religion will lead to innovation. And innovation will lead to misguidance. And all misguidance ending places the hellfire. Allahu wa iyyakum minhu. May Allah protect us and you from the fire. Ameen. Wa ba'd. We back to our Sira class. Inshallah, we're going to keep it short today. We under we still is under the, the fourth means, Al Wasila to Rabi'ah, which was the means that the Kufar used to douse out the Dawah of the Prophet and destroy it and to chase the Muslims away from Islam and to leave it. And the fourth means that they used was Al Ittihad al Aam, general oppression, Wa Kathratul Ida, an abundancy of causing harm, physical harm. To the believers, was al bala, and intensified trials. And what we're covering under that subject matter, because this one is a little lengthy, because he wants to clarify what the Sahaba and the Prophet, sorry, the Prophet and his companions went through, and how Allah dealt with it, and how the Prophet dealt with it, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or how Allah and His Messenger dealt with it. For the point of understanding that very hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says, Ashaddu Nasi Ibtila and Al Anbiya that the most severe and trials and tribulations are the prophets and messengers. Thumma amthal fil amtha, then those who are like them and those who are most like them. And this is the haq. And this should bring solace to us once we see and truly understand the type of difficulties and trials. That our messenger and his sahaba went through it will it will play down whatever we go through if we try to compare it to it compare our trials to their trials and because if that's done the golden objective from this is that we look to how they try to fix it and we imitate that in trying to fix our problems that's the golden objective here we're not talking about the prophet Sirah so we can have you know tell a good story <laughs> The objective here is that we learn life lessons and know how Allah wants us to resolve our own problems, which the Muslims do not do anymore. And as we said early on, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah had ordered him on how to deal with his problems. As we mentioned, Allah Ta'ala says, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ in Surah Al-Hijr, verse 20, 97 and 98. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ And glorify your Lord with His praises. Right? And we clarified in the khutbah we did about SubhanAllah and Alhamdulillah. That one of the, we saw in the Quran, and one of the, the times that SubhanAllah is mentioned in the book of Allah is always when the Muslims or the people, the believers fell into some form of Sin or disobedience 
and they will say subhanallah and it's like a form of repentance testifying to Allah's perfections and free from imperfections while you you acknowledging your imperfection because that leads to tawbah because Allah created us to fall into these things so we repent and go back to him so here Likewise, we say subhanAllah in severe trials and alhamdulillah in severe trials. And here we have Allah telling his prophet, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ Rabbik," And glorify with the praises, glorify your Lord with his praises. وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ And be from the people who prostrate, from the prostrators. Now, so Allah Ta'ala, as we mentioned previously, Ibn Kathir, he's clarifying for us. In explaining this verse That Allah is telling us In essence To rely on him And to find Know that sufficiency is in Allah And that Allah is going to Sufficient for you in Allah Muhammad And also the believers And that Allah is going to aid you against them So busy yourself With the remembrance of Allah With the praising of Allah The glorifying of Allah and the worship of him, which is the prayer. And this is where the Muslims are supposed to go to to fix their problems. Unfortunately, as we said before, many of the Muslims, we do like the kufar. We go get counseling or therapy. We go see a psychiatrist. The kufar do that because they have no Lord. We didn't find this during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Our counseling is through our shuyukh. Our students of knowledge that's been educated and trained for this. But the first and key component is here what we're saying. And then the Sheikh ended it, that point was saying, Allah tells the Prophet, and worship your Lord until death come to you. Meaning with this method to deal with your problems. So we we begin from this. Showing how the Prophet dealt with affairs and how if something would bother him, he would rush to the Salah. But these are, are habits that are learned and practiced. Just like what we do here to resolve issues is a habit that's been learned and practiced. But many of us do not realize how much we imitate the Kufar in our daily affairs and how we resolve our problems. And we do not follow the resolution for our issues the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw issues. Now, from there, we said last time as a point of benefit, we talked about the various forms of persecution that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Sahabas went through. And the last we was covering of the oppression and the wrongdoing that the Sahabas was, was going through, we mentioned the story of what happened to Abu Bakr, which in the stories that happened to Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir, Ammar the son of Yasir, who his mother, Sumeya, was the first female martyr, Sumeya, and his father was a martyr. And we talked about him being persecuted, and as a form of a question, when we talked about that, we told the story about Imam Ahmed for the point of bringing out understanding how to apply this hadith that yes that Ammar he said that he said what they wanted when they tortured him and he came back to the prophet apologizing looking for pardoning for what he had did and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said wa in adu ya Ammar ud that if they return back to doing this to you again do the same thing you did the last time and we said, so the question is, when is that permissible for us to do something like this? Y'all remember? What was the one main condition that would give permissibility to deal with affairs like that? Does anybody remember? From that hadith of Ahmad, when is it permissible to stay a statement of kufr to save ourselves? What has to happen based on what we learned from the hadith of Ahmad? Yeah. You can't believe it in your heart. You can't believe not just that's true. You can't believe it in your heart. What was the other thing? For some reason I can't find a page. <laughs> there it is, okay. 
If you remember, you have to be tortured. You can't just be threatened and you do this act. You have to have been tortured like Ammar was actually physically tortured. And that was the thing that Imam Ahmed, when the scholars during his time made this statement, was saying the Quran was created. The ones that did it after being tortured, he had no problem with that. Because the hadith of Ammar applied to them. But the ones that said it were just being just on the strength of being threatened by the ruler, he would got give he would not speak to them until he died. He boycotted them today that he died. As a means to make them make tawbah for that. Right? And one of them was Yahya ibn Ma'in, who was a contemporary of Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed didn't talk to him up until he died. And we said he came to him visiting him in his grave. Yahya ibn Ma'in came to visit Imam Ahmed in his grave and he said he came to visit him and when he saw him he turned his head and wouldn't even speak to him or look at him. And he said the hadith of Ammar The hadith of Ammar And he wouldn't say nothing to him And then he, he left Out the room Went outside And he died Shortly a day after Really shortly after he sat and When the people came out We said that Yahya ibn Ma'in asked him What did he have to say about what I said about the hadith of Ammar And the point here Look at the zeal of the scholars for knowledge he, wasn't, he was only asking that question to the people who was present so he can learn from Imam Ahmed, even at his deathbed. He said, what did he say? What did he say to my proof? He said, that hadith don't apply to you because you wasn't tortured, you was just threatened. You wasn't tortured, you was just threatened. And this is a powerful hadith because when Yasser, I mean, Ahmad ibn Yasser went through that, he responded, Allah Ta'ala responded to his situation in Surah to nahl Man kafara billah That whoever disbelieves in Allah Illa except those men ukriha Who has been coerced or forced Wa qalbuhu mutma'innun bil iman While at the state of doing this force Which you're being forced to say of kufr Your heart is transfers tranquility in iman Meaning with your tongue saying your heart don't believe it and this is what Allah reveals. So I heard a student of knowledge say before who tried to use this as a proof from when a person threatened to compromise. I said, no, it has to be. The situation has to match the situation. Okay. And when the brother said, he said, no, no, it's permissible. I said, okay, where's your deliver? Allah didn't reveal this ayah until after Yasser was punished. And he said what he said. And he came to the prophet and Allah revealed this. You, that is the only exception. So this is from the things that we covered last time. Now to then today, last we ended the class with giving different illustrations of the torture and the persecution that the Sahaba radiallahu anhu went through. We mentioned Abu Fukeha, his name was Aflah. He was the free slave of Safwan ibn Umayyah ibn Khalf. He accepted Islam at the same time Bilal, and we mentioned that he went through a similar persecution where he was dragged in the mid in the midday in the severe heat he was dragged and his feet was chained with metal iron um, feeders burning his skin and he was dragged in his clothing and turned on his face on hot sand burning hot sand Right? And then they would turn him on his back and then put a rock. Excuse me. They would put a heavy, while he was on his face, on his stomach, on his face, they would put a heavy rock on his back. Right? So he couldn't move. And they would keep him like that until he couldn't even comprehend what was going on. He liked losing his, his intellect. And they didn't cease punishing him until he made hijrah to Abyssinia. We talked about that. They would tie his feet with rock, with, with rope and drag him through through the streets, um, uh, drag him through hot sand, ripping his skin off. They would choke him until they thought he was dead. And then Abu Bakr purchased him and freed him as a slave from being a slave. He freed seven companions. We talked about Khabab ibn Arit, who was the free slave of Umm Anmar, bintu Siba al al Khaza'iya. He was from the first of the people to accept Islam. He used to be an iron worker where he would make weapons, he would make swords. 
when he accepted Islam, his owner, his female owner, Um Ammar, tortured and punished him with fire. She would come with a hot iron, like you do to, you know, to melt iron, to formulate iron. She would place it on his back and on his head until he disbelieved in Muhammad. And all that did was increase him in more iman and submission to the deen of Allah. And the polytheists used to punish this man and would turn him on his neck and they would drag him by his hair through the fire, through fire. And the only way the fire would be put out through the dragging of him through it. His back to his flesh from his coming out of his back would put out the fire. Meaning the fat that was in the back on his back would come out and put out the fire. This is the type of torture that the Sahaba radiallahu anhu went through for this deen. And we need to hear this, brothers and sisters in Islam. Those who hear me in present and those who hear the recording. That we need to hear this to see what the, these great human beings whom Ibn Mas'ud and described them. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation... He looked into the hearts of all of his creation From the first of them to the last of them And then the messenger of Allah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam When he saw the, when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw The most pure of his hearts He chose them to be the companions of Muhammad He chose them to be the companions of Muhammad So these are the people With whom Allah chose To be able to handle this The most purest of hearts That's why we can never be better than them In how to execute and practice the deen of Islam. Rather, we revere them, we love them, we study their lives so that we can imitate their practice of the deen. Now, nah. so that we can perfect practice under the deen and then we take the ummah to another level of success. And then we, we also mentioned the story of Zaniratu, who was a female slave from Rome, one of the early women to accept Islam. She was punished for the sake of Allah and she was. At to, to such an extent she lost her eyesight She became blind from the punishment And it was said to her Your blindness You've been afflicted with the God of Lat and Uzza The deities of Lat and Uzza That's who caused you to go blind And she would respond And she would say Kether, Like you really you saying that really? Wallahi ma huwa kada He said well she said I swear by Allah it, The situation ain't like that For Allahu alayhi basar Because she said that while being in a state of blindness And they said that statement of kufr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Returned her eyesight to her immediately Immediately Look at the conviction of these companions Upon the religion Because the messenger of Allah Grew in them Or Allah grew inside of them Iman Strong understanding of Allah His messenger and the prophets and the angels The last day The pre-belief and predestination Strongly embedded in them To this was their response To these type of tortures Other benefit we could take from this Tremendous story of hers Is that How Allah aid the believers When they're aiding his deen how Allah aid the Muslims when they're serving his religion. When they're sacrificing their wealth and their selves and their lives for the spread of Tawheed and the practice of Islam. Likewise, when we look at the Ummah today, how we lose in the wars that we've participated in and the difficulties that we've gone, we go through is because we don't serve Islam. Through number one, learning it and practicing it. Then number two, calling to it. And playing a part on whatever level you can play a part. Like the Sahaba did. So that the heart can face real life problems. As you see this woman. Here she's blinded by this torture. And they said, see, your blindness was of course by, you affected by Latin Urza. She said, really? She, in Arabic, Kether? <laughs> like that. Kether? Wallahi ma huwa kathala She said Ba Allah that ain't the case For Allah alayha basaraha And Allah returned her eyesight to her immediately Right And she was of the first seven Of those She was the seventh person With whom Abu Bakr as Siddiq Freed purchased her And freed her from slavery And from that torture 
as this was narrated by in Sir and the Mughazi by Ibn Ishaq. Now, and also from Ibn Hajj's famous Sir book called Al Isaba, Fi Tamyizi Bain Sahaba. So, that's one. Then we mentioned the story of Umais. Who ex um Ume um Ubais, excuse me, um Ummu Ubais, who had accepted Islam, Radiallahu Anha, who was the free slave. Um, she was a free, I mean she was a, a slave girl too, or a, sl a young girl from the tribe of of Zuhra, or the septic of Zuhra. The polytheists used to punish her, specifically her owner, Al Aswad ibn Abdul Yaghuth. He used to punish her. And he was one of the worst enemies to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was from those who used to make mockery of the deen. Abu Bakr purchased her also and freed her. And she was the wife of Kariz ibn Rabi'a ibn Habib ibn Abd al-Shams, as also is in al Isab. But then we talked about this, the young slave girl. Assalamu alaikum. We talked about the young slave girl, Umar ibn Khattab. And he used to torture her before he accepted Islam. And Allah Ta'ala saved her. Many of, there was many women who went through torture who had accepted Islam. So these are from amongst the affairs of what took place with the Sahabas that we mentioned. We mentioned was punished many slaves like Amr ibn Fuhayra, who was the free slave of Abu Bakr. He was punished until the point he lost consciousness and he, wasn't, he didn't even know what he was saying out of his mouth. And then we ended this class with talking about Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And then we're going to talk about him further. And we want to bring Surah to Layl, what Layli Ida Yagsha, and by the night and what it covers. When Nahari Ida Tajalla, and by the day and what it makes apparent. When it shines from the, the day come. This sword was revealed because of Abu Bakr. One of the reasons of revelation was Abu Bakr. Because of what he had done in freeing these slaves. As we about to talk about. So here now we're getting into how the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Helps under, help you understand the Quran. Hear the story. وَقَدْ اشْتَرَى أَبُو بَكْرِ Abu Bakr had purchased those female and male slaves. May Allah be pleased with all of them. And he freed all of them. And his father reprimanded him for freeing so many slaves. His father, Abu Bakr's father, Abu Qahafa, he Reprimanded him for doing that Because in their eyes You only free slaves When there's some Profitable benefit In it for you Okay So Abu Bakr His father Reprimanded him For freeing those slaves And he said to him Araka Tu'tik Riqabin di'afin What is it that I see you Freeing poor slaves Weak poor slaves that if you were to free strong men, they would have hindered you. So Abu Bakr who responds to his father. In other words, he's saying to his son, why are you freeing people that you're not getting nothing from it? You know what I'm saying? And Abu Bakr who response was, Inni uridu wajh Allah. Truly, I only want the face of Allah in what I'm doing. For anzal Allahu Quran and madha fihi Abu Bakr. So Allah revealed the Quran or Surah of the Quran, praising in that Surah Abu Bakr. Wa dhamma agda'a, and Allah found his enemies blameworthy in this verse, in this Surah, in this Surah, because He gave the description that like we said before a lot of times in the Quran. Allah, as we love to bring these benefits, is that the Deen of Islam. Is based off a nephew well, if that Negating What opposes Islam And that which is prohibited While affirming The truth 
and the practice of it and the rewards that come with that. So Allah Ta'ala will do that in the Quran and he doing one after the other so we can see the because things is, as Sheikh Earth, as the principle goes, that opposites is how things become clear. So Allah in the Quran, the method of Allah giving da'wah in his book is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention one thing of goodness and righteousness and piety while at the same time after mentioning that, he had mentioned evilness and wickedness and their punishments. So the picture can be clearly drawn between haqq and batil. As Allah does all through the Quran. And this is one of the things, brothers and sisters, that when you look at many of the callers today, especially those who are very, very famous here in the Western world, without mentioning no names, that everybody like to listen to. We call them a students of knowledge that's following the ulama. We call them motivative speakers. They're not callers to Islam the way the Salaf the way Allah calls to his, his way in the, his book and the way the messenger of Allah. Because this is important to mention for what reason? Many of the people, when we warned other people to stay away from listening to some of these well-known callers, they say, what's wrong with him? All they quote is Allah and his messenger. And so the first response is, number one, of course they quote Allah and his messenger. Because... They want to, today we trying to get in the West Muslims just to come back to praying, come back to fasting, come back to being a basic Muslim. So this is what they tend to focus on. But the method that they're calling to these hadiths or these ayats is not the way Allah gives da'wah. When we set out to give da'wah, we got to call to the path of Allah upon basira. And the basira that Allah has established da'wah, his book, is your da'wah got to be based off clarifying the truth while exposing the falsehood. If you call to Islam, you got to be warning against kufr, disbelief. Jumlatan or tafsir, as the scholars call it. In general and in specific. If you're going to call to tawheed, you must warn against shirk. Jumlatan or tafsir. Generally and specifically. When you call to Sunnah, you must call warn against its opposite in Bid'ah. Jumlatan or Tafsir. Generally and specifically. This is what you don't see in a Dawah. They may do that, especially when it comes to Tawheed. And men, they may say stuff generally. And they don't refute that which is opposite of it. But Allah does that all through the Quran to, so that we, things can become clear for us. The haq can become clear. And that's Islam. And that's how Allah establishes da'wah, which we're about to see in this story. Once again, when Abu Bakr's father, radiallahu anhu, said what he said to him. Again, his father said, what is this that I see you freeing weak slaves? If only... If only you free strong men So that they can protect you He responded I only doing and seeking Allah's face Allah revealed some Quranic some Quran praising in it Abu Bakr and finding blameworthy his enemies. Qala Ta'ala. Allah says, Surah Talil, verse 14 to verse 16. Verse 14, so that's three verses 14, 15, 16. Listen what Allah Ta'ala ta ta says. And now pay attention for the negation and the affirmation. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَنذَرْتُكُمْ نَارًا تَلَظَّى did we not warn you? Allah's talking to the Kufar. Did we not warn you of a fire that is kindled and burning? La yaslaha illa al ashqa. And no one will burn in it except the, those who have a high level of misery. The one 
who rejected the Quran and turned away from the call of Islam. And here, that is talking about Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And all those who was resembling this characteristic of his, who was an enemy to Islam. So here Allah is drawing the picture of how he sees the people who do what this man did. They were warned. Did we not warn you of a fire that is kindled? And no one is burnt in it except the most miserable. The one who rejected the Quran and turned away. That's Umayyah ibn Khalaf and those that's like him. Then Allah Ta'ala says, وَسَيُجَنَّبُ هَلْ أَتْقَى And shall be distant and shall be far distant from it. Meaning the hellfire is al atqa The most pious, the most righteous. And then Allah give his description. The one who gives his wealth to purify himself. The one who gives his wealth to purify himself. There is not anyone who has with him any bounty to jazah, except that he's going to be rewarded for it. Hil except the one there's no one who has a bounty except that he's going to be recompensed. Except the one who seeks the face of his Lord the Most High. And this is Abu Bakr is Siddiq, and there's no difference of opinion about that. As we find this in Al Mustadrik with a good chain, and in Sirat Ibn Hisham, and the Tabakat of Ibn Sa'd, and also in the books of Tafsir that we previously mentioned. That like Ibn Kathir and other than them. So, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing wickedness, give an example of it, and their attributes. And he's describing righteousness and give an example. But here you see Allah said it generally without mentioning these people's name. And this is another thing about da'wah that we want to bring to fruition. When we look at the da'wah of the Quran, Allah always generalizes. Rarely do he mention names and specify. He usually specified the most wicked of the wicked of the wicked. Like, for example, who was Fir'aun? Who was the Pharaoh? This was a name that anybody who ran Egypt before Moses' time, he was called Fir'aun. Like we call everyone who, be, who runs our country in America president. But that's not his name. The president of the United States. So we say Fir'aun back then, Pharaoh. Who was the Pharaoh that Musa fought against? Nobody knows who that person was. Allah never told us. Yeah, you got ignorant people who try to say it was Ramses, his name. But there's no evidence to support this. Allah didn't mention names. So when refuting, you should keep your refutation for the most part general. Because the golden objective that Allah wants that us to learn from the lesson, it's not that this is about Abu Bakr. It's not that this who has been refuted has been um, Umayyah ibn Khalaf. But the lesson is to stay away from those attributes and characteristics and to assume those attributes and characteristics. That's the objective. So the objective of refutation is the haq be practiced and falsehood be abandoned. And unfortunately, we live in a time some mashayikh unfortunately left off this characteristic of how to refute that Allah did in the Quran and also the messenger of Allah did during his time sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you hear them more specifying and naming names more than they keeping it general and bringing refuting the action and this is what you tend to find from the kibar ulama following this characteristic in their refutation in following the book of Allah which once again was whose character became known his character was the Quran was who? The Messenger of Allah. What well, light is Deen is simple light. But the thing is, we gotta learn these principles and hold on to them and not praise no one individuals or few individuals above this religion. And learn the principles of this deen so we can hold firm to them. And we hold each other accountable to them. So after that. Urwa ibn Zubair had mentioned that Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, the companion, Urwa ibn Zubair, he mentioned that Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, had freed 
from those who were punished for the sake of Allah seven. And we're going to name them. Amr ibn Fuhaira. We already mentioned him, but we're going to rename him. Amr ibn Fuhaira. This is now the sheikh who, my sheikh Taha Abdul Maksu, he's mentioning after he gave the stories, now he's bringing in proof, proof that specifically mentions who was the seven that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu saved from torture and freed them from slavery that caused Allah to better with ta'ala to reveal the ayah that we previously mentioned, 14 through um, 16, and then also 17, the 14 through 16 talks about Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Verse in Surah Talay from verse 17 to 20 talks about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So when we read that, think about that and strive to meet these characteristics because this the best human being to walk this earth after prophets and messengers was Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Uh, he says, the first one is Amir ibn Fuhaira. Amir ibn Fuhaira. The second person was Bilal. Ibn Rabah. Bilal ibn Rabah. I'm going to say him three times, each one. Amir ibn Fuhaira. Go study their lives. Go read about these companions who were slaves. Number two was Bilal ibn Rabah, who was already famous to us. Number three was Zanira, that woman. Her name was Zanira, who she was a Roman, Roman woman who, had a, who was a slave. Okay? That was number three. Again, Zanira. Um, uh, she was um, known as, I mean, she was Rumiya. Number four. She was Roman, I mean. Rumiya means Roman. Number four, Um Rubais. Um Rubais. Okay? Who was from the tribe of Zuhra. Number five, Um Rubais. Um Rubais. From the word Abasa, Rubais. Um Rubais. Number four, number five was a Nahda. Nahdiya. A Nahdiya. That was a woman. We mentioned her already. Number six was her sister. Was her sister. He paid, he freed her. And the seventh one was Jadia Bani Amr ibn Mu'ammil was the slave girl of the tribe of Amr ibn Mu'ammil. These were the seven people whom Abu Bakr al-Siddiq purchased and freed them. Alhamdulillah. So here, these are a, pictures and examples, or 14 examples we mentioned, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the torture that the Sahaba and the companions went through. And he mentions after that, after talking about the torture, he said that from the categories, let me see what time it is, I'll keep it short. Bismillah. Inshallah, another seven, eight minutes, seven to ten minutes. He says also from the characteristic from the different types of, of harm in which occurred to the companions of the Prophet, in addition to what we've mentioned, is number fifteen is what Bukhari and Muslim has narrated. From the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Ibn Abbas said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said to Abu Dhar. To Abu Dhar. Meaning Al-Ghafari. After he accepted Islam. And wallah, if you read his story, how he became Muslim. Very, very interesting story. I encourage you to read Abu Dhar Al-Ghafari. He's very famous to us from the hadith. He's one of the narrators of the hadiths. In 40 hadiths of Imam al-Nawawi. The hadith near the end. Where he talk about if we was to do sins that reach up to the sky, so you look at look at some look about his read about his life. It's very a lot of benefit. But Bukhari and Muslim narrates a, a hadith on the authority of Ibn Abbas that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said to Abu Dhar when he had accepted Islam, "Irja ila qawmik fa'akhbirhum hatta yatiyka amri." The Prophet told him, "Go back to your people and inform them until." Comes to you a command for me. So go back home, give da'wah, inform your people until a command comes for you to come back, in other words. For God. So he said to him, to the Prophet, By the one who sent you with the truth, truly I shall scream before my people this truth. So he left 
and he entered the masjid of the Prophet. I mean, not the Prophet, the masjid in, in Mecca. Masjid al Haram in Mecca, right? Fanada bi a'la sawdin. And he yelled out with the loudest voice he could. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. And this at the time when the Muslims were being persecuted. He said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is no deity in truth except Allah. And then Muhammadan is the messenger of Allah. So I sallam. Thumma qam al qawm. Then the people stood up. فضربوه, and they struck him until they knocked him over unconscious. فأتاه العباس فأكب عليه فقال ويلكم ألستم تعلمون أنه من غفار So العباس, the prophet's uncle, entered, saw him toppled over like that, and he said, woe unto you people. Don't y'all know he come from the tribe of Ghifar? And that the pathway we take to do business, to do tijara, to do commerce and business, going to Sham, we pass by these people. And they will get revenge for him. And then he came back the next day, because that, that got them to leave him alone. He came back the next day and did the same thing. He yelled out to the people, same thing. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. And of course, they, it incited them. And they tortured him again. They used to find Jannah through this, brothers and sisters in Islam. We can't even do Islam enough to stop doing basic haram stuff. You think these people was falling into some of the basic haram that we can't stop doing? Of course not. They look forward to losing their life in the path of Allah, being hurt in the path of Allah. Where are we in regards to this? Number 16, Imam Bukhari narrates on the authority of Qais ibn Abi Hazm. And he said, oh, by the way, in that narration, when they tortured him, he was so de de beat up and de de uh, de uh, 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 harmed and hurt that he stayed in the Kaaba. Now, this is before he met the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He stayed in the Kaaba when they tortured him for 30 days. No food. Only thing he had to drink was Zamzam water. Nothing else he drank or ate, just Zamzam water. And it made him become fat and cured all his ailments. Oh. Imam Bukhari narrates, and we're going to end with this narration. Imam Bukhari narrates on Qais ibn Abi Hazim. He said, I heard Sa'id ibn Zayd ibn Amr in the masjid of Kufa. He will say, Wallahi, laqad ra'aytani wa inna Umar la muthiqi ala al-Islam qabla an yuslim Umar. Wa fi laf, law ra'aytani muthiqi Umar ala al-Islam ala wa ukhtuhu wa ma aslam. And he narrated, Qais ibn Hazm, he said, I heard Sa'id ibn Zayd ibn Amr in the masjid in Kufa say, By Allah, if only you could have seen me when Umar was of the people before he accepted Islam, was of those who was from the Muthiqi of Islam, before Umar had accepted Islam. And we're going to talk about that next week, what that means, inshallah ta'ala. I'm going to leave you with food for thought. <laughs> Brothers, wallahi, barakallahu fikum. These stories is paramount for us to learn. And this is the reason, the very reason. Now imagine if our children was taught these things when they were little growing up. The Sahaba, anhum, when I first started this theater class, not here, but in New York, about two years ago. We did 17 class in Mashad Ahl Quran with Sunnah. Before we stop, and I'm continuing here. That one of the things the Sheikh said in the beginning is that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that they would teach their children the seerah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like they would teach them the Quran. And they would teach the battles. And the wars the Prophet taught like they would teach the Quran. You know why? 
Because in that you learn How Allah deals with his creation And they wanted their children to be raised In knowing who Allah was And this is how we learn who Allah was Allah, many of us who go through difficulties With our children being influenced with this society A lot of times They can't Come out of Like Sheikh Ibn Iba said That if you don't learn the aqid of the salaf and the life of the Prophet and his companions, you will not be able to remove yourself from the mindset of the people of your time. And this is a true statement. So just imagine if we did this with our children like how the Sahaba did and raised them learning the battles of the Prophet, taught our children the Quran and ibadah so that they can know who Allah is and how Allah deals with his creation. Imagine how our children would be now. Because one of the consistent things that I see with our children, alhamdulillah, even I'm talking about now the children who may be practicing Islam. They Muslims, they pray, they fast. You know, they got some obvious, clear love for the deen. But one consistent thing we don't see from our children is them helping this da'wah. We don't see it for many of our children, for most of our children. Because they didn't see, hear these type of stories and was raised on them as children until they turned 18 and older age. And we all blameworthy for this stuff. Because nobody taught us how the Sahabas gave da'wah and how they raised their children and how, the, how they developed strength in the deen in their children. Or uh, not, how they um, planted the seed of iman like this inside of their children. And it's important that we learn these stories and we convey these stories to our children. Wallahi, we should be able to all say, Alhamdulillah, I mean, with pride. This is a permissible form of pridefulness. I made sure my children, my family, we went through all of Tafsir ibn Kathir. It's been on our shelf for 10 years and we read that joint at least twice. I went through Rahiq al Maktoum or the Splitted Moon several times, me and my family. My children was raised on that. I taught them and I also read it. This type of stuff should be coming off the tongue of Salafis. Wallahi, to distinguish our families and our circumstances from the rest of everybody. Wallahi, my children is grown with. Me. And I only got two children, well, one child staying with me and one temporary staying with me now. Anybody come to my house, we got to, like to this morning, I made my son, Abdurrahman, my oldest son. I sat down and said, read the Latha to Sul in Arabic to me. It only took us about five minutes. We read it. He read the, I read the, he read the first half, I read the second half. We got to keep this deen going like that, you know? This is a lifestyle. Ilm is a part of our life. And this is how we should be. Family come over. We ain't just having a cookout and invite. Let's have some ilm shared. Why we do this? Let's read some Quran. We ain't got to be the whole family time. But it's so much a part of our life. Everything we do, we see that mixed in it on some degree, even if it's a small degree. But why he benefits? I remember when I was a young boy growing up here in North New Jersey. May Allah reward the elders of the community. That they used to always have physical activities for the youth, the elders of the community. May Allah reward them, brothers. And these were African American brothers. They will have activities for the youth. And then before we start the activities, we used to go through the books, the Islamic studies books of Bilal Phillips. It made us love Islam. And I tell them brothers all the time, Wallahi, whatever Allah blessed me with the knowledge and practice and da'wah, y'all get rewarded for that. Inshallah, if it's accepted by Allah, y'all gonna get to share in that reward. Because of what they did in breeding love of Islam in our lives. So, you know, I just want to encourage And if you're grown and your kids grown, it ain't too late to start. Because you ain't dead. You're not dead. It's better that you do die and go to Allah and say, I made the attempt to do this, even though I ain't do it with my children when they were young. I did it now while they're grown. Whatever circumstance you're able to do it with. So I encourage this with our brothers and sisters that we return back to ilm and it become live. It be enlivened in our lives that we can honestly say, this is what's going on with my family. Oh Allah, I hope you accept it from us. So from there we say, have the sallallahu alayhi wa sallam,
على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وما كان خطأ وزللا فمني والشيطان وما كان سوابا فمن الله فإن الله ورسوله براء من زلل وخطئ سبحانكم بحمدك شر لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك أستغفرك وأتوب إليك whatever I said was wrong and mistaken slip of the tongue was from me and the shaitan whatever I said was correct and on time it was only from Allah for indeed Allah and his messenger is free from my errors وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين